So you know that picture with the frog choking the bird that's trying to eat him? Well, historically speaking, that frog is Afghanistan. Okay, so we're going back to 1839 and the first Anglo-Afghan War, which was part of the much larger 65-year series of basically proxy wars between Russia and Britain over parts of Central and Southern Asia known as the Great Game. Russia liked to expand and Britain didn't want to lose India, and yeah, they liked to expand too. Long story short, the British wanted the Afghans on their side, but the Afghans had a problem with the Sikh Empire. And seeing as they could only choose one, and they saw the Sikhs as the bigger threat, they chose the Sikhs. But when the British heard that Russia might have a meeting with Afghani Amir Dost Muhammad Khan to discuss an alliance, they took it upon themselves to invade, take the city of Kabul, causing Khan to flee, and they put a new, more British-leaning ruler, Shah Shuja, in his place. Shuja had been a king of the Afghans before being deposed and exiled back in 1809, and let me tell you, he was not what I would call a decent human being. He was mostly known during his exile for how he mutilated his slaves anytime they did something that displeased pleased him. With eyewitness accounts of his entire staff either missing ears, limbs, genitals, or any combination of those. A tent once blew over in strong winds and he had the man responsible for it being put up castrated on the spot. That's who we're talking about here. Oh, and while he was in exile, he was being paid by the British government. Keep in mind, when we're saying British here, we mean the British East India Company. Yeah, there's a reason that flag looks familiar, which was a company that the Crown had given control over India to. Britain did this quite a bit. They didn't really care what happened in their colonies as long as the money kept coming in. And India was their biggest money maker, but this was a strategy that may not have been the best in the long run. The guy in charge of India was Lord Auckland, and he was the one who pushed to take Afghanistan, just making sure everybody's clear on that. He was also in charge of roughly 200,000 troops, mostly Indian, but all the officers were British. The Afghans weren't too happy. The tribes around the city were paid off in bribes by the British, but they decided that it was too expensive and stopped, which turned the tribes against them. It also didn't help that most of the city's inhabitants either didn't remember Shuja, or if they did remember him, it was as a horrible tyrant. Add in that Khan's son, Akbar Khan, had begun an uprising, oh, and a good number of troops were recalled from the city and a new military leader, Major General William Elphinstone, was put in place. To give you an idea of Elphinstone's ability as a leader, he was considered the most incompetent soldier to ever become a general. That's a quote, by the way. The uprising gained more and more strength, largely due to Elphinstone's incompetence, and before long, the British were worried about losing the city. Khan invited a group of British diplomats to discuss peace. However, he had them executed when they arrived. Elphinstone did come to a peace agreement with Khan on January 1st, 1842. Though the terms weren't very good for the British, Khan did promise them an escort and safety on their march to Jalalabad about 90 miles away. So on January 6th, the army of 4,500 soldiers as well as about 12,000 civilians who were soldiers' families, servants, British and Indian residents of Kabul that knew they'd have a better chance with the Brits. So men, women, children, old people, the whole lot. Plus it was winter and their journey required them to cross the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Oh, and they abandoned Shuja. He ended up being assassinated later on. So with Khan in charge of Kabul, the Brits headed off and were pretty much immediately fired upon from the city. It's reported that Khan ordered his men not to fire, but ordered the tribe's people to do the opposite. Also, the escort he promised them? Yeah, that was a lie. There was no escort, though he kept up the image by explaining that the Brits had left before the escort had arrived. The sick and wounded were left in the city as they wouldn't survive the trip, but as soon as the army left, the Afghans killed everyone they left. After a few days of pretty much constant attacks from snipers, Elphinstone met with Khan, and Khan told Elphinstone to give him a little bit more more time to make proper agreements with the tribes for the Brits' safety. Of course, this was all bullshit and was only Khan buying the tribes with more time to set up ambushes. And to give an update, three days in, 25 miles traveled, 3,000 dead. Some for being ambushed, some from hypothermia, frostbite, and frozen guns became a problem. Also on the third day, the wives and families, British and Indian, accepted Khan's offer of protection if they headed back to the city. Instead, he had everyone except the British wives and children killed, and he then took them captive. On the 11th, Khan met with Elphinstone and one of his officers, but rather than having discussions on anything, they were taken captive. The army was down to 200 soldiers by this point. So basically, Khan had lied through his teeth the entire time and sent the Brits off to certain doom, to which there's only one real reaction. <gasps> Wait, does that mean we get to use it? Please tell me we have the clip. 
I've <laughs> been wanting to use that one for a while. And so, without their fearless leader, they continued on, coming to a six-foot barricade of thorny oak the tribe's people had set up. They were constantly fired upon as they tried to climb over. By this point, the soldiers had broken into groups and were just trying to survive. Fifteen officers were killed when they reached a small village. Twenty or so became surrounded on a hilltop, and most of them were killed. Eight or nine were taken prisoner. On January 13th, William Bryden, an assistant army surgeon, was spotted badly wounded and riding a wounded horse by guards on the walls of Jalalabad being pursued by tribesmen, and a force was sent to fight them off. When Bryden was asked where the army was, his response was, I am the army. Remember, this event was a big deal. It greatly diminished the perceived strength of the British military. Lord Auckland reportedly suffered a stroke when he heard the news. And his replacement, who had already been scheduled to take over, sent an army of retribution. That's actually what they were called. Long story short, they defeated some armies, captured, looted, partially destroyed, and moved on from several cities and towns before retaking Cobb itself. They destroyed part of the city, did the whole loot and pillage thing, and then went back to India. They did end up gathering up some of the released British prisoners, including 32 officers, 50 plus soldiers, 21 children, and 12 women. Elphinstone was not among them as he had already died in captivity. Also, supposedly some of the Indian troops had fled back to Kabul during their retreat, many of whom had lost limbs due to frostbite, and most of whom were sold into slavery. The Brits supposedly freed some of them too. Oh, and one last thing, as far as what happened to Akbar Khan, he served as Amir until 1845 when he died, possibly from being poisoned. And the man believed to have poisoned him? Supposedly the man that succeeded him, his father, Dost Muhammad Khan. Only one thing you could really say about that. Hey, we got to use it twice.